Chapter Seven of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven. Early in the fifties, there was living in Moscow, in very straitened circumstances, almost in poverty, the numerous family of the princes Osinin. These were real princes, not Tartar Georgians, but pure-blooded descendants of Rory. Their name is often to be met with in our chronicles under the first grand princes of Moscow, who created a united Russia. They possessed wide acres and many domains. Many a time they were rewarded for service and blood and disablement. They sat in the council of boyars. One of them even rose to a very high position, but they fell under the ban of the empire through the plots of enemies on a charge of witchcraft and evil viltres and they were ruined terribly and beyond recall. They were deprived of their rank and banished to remote parts. The Osinins fell and had never risen again, had never attained to power again. The ban was taken off in time, and they were even reinstated in their Moscow house and belongings, but it was of no avail. Their family was impoverished, run to seed. It did not revive under Peter, nor under Catherine, and constantly dwindling and growing humbler, it had by now reckoned private stewards, managers of wine-shops, and ward police inspectors among its members. The family of Osinins, of whom we have made mention, consisted of a husband and wife and five children. It was living near the dog's place, in a one-storied little wooden house, with a striped portico looking on to the street, green lions on the gates, and all the other pretensions of nobility, though it could hardly make both ends meet, was constantly in debt at the green grocer's, and often sitting without firewood or candles in the winter. The prince himself was a dull, indolent man, who had once been a handsome dandy, but had gone to seed completely. More from regard for his wife, who had been a maid of honour, than from respect for his name, he had been presented with one of those old-fashioned Moscow posts that have a small salary, a queer-sounding name, and absolutely no duties attached. He never meddled in anything, and did nothing but smoke from morning till night, breathing heavily, and always wrapped in a dressing-gown. His wife was a sickly irritable woman, forever worried over domestic trifles, over getting her children placed in government schools, and keeping up her Petersburg connections. She could never accustom herself to her position and her remoteness from the court. Litvinov's father had made acquaintance with the Osinins during his residence at Moscow, had had occasion to do them some services, and had once lent them three hundred roubles, and his son often visited them while he was a student. His lodging happened to be at no great distance from their house but he was not drawn to them simply as near neighbours, nor tempted by their comfortless way of living. He began to be a frequent visitor at their house, after he had fallen in love with their eldest daughter, Irina. She had then completed her seventeenth year. She had only just left school, from which her mother withdrew her through a disagreement with the principal. This disagreement arose from the fact that Irina was to have delivered at a public function some verses in French, complimentary to the curator, and just before the performance her place was filled by another girl, the daughter of a very rich spirit contractor. The princess could not stomach this affront, and indeed Irina herself never forgave the principal for this act of injustice. She had been dreaming beforehand of how she would rise before the eyes of every one, attracting universal attention, and would deliver her speech and how Moscow would talk about her afterwards. And, indeed, Moscow would have talked about her afterwards. She was a tall, slim girl, with a somewhat hollow chest and narrow, unformed shoulders, with a skin of a dead white, rare at her age, and pure and smooth as china, with thick, fair hair. There were dark tresses mingled in a very original way with the light ones. Her features, exquisitely, almost too perfectly, correct, had not yet quite lost the innocent expression that belongs to childhood. The languid curves of her lovely neck, and her smile, half indifferent, half weary, 
betrayed the nervous temperament of a delicate girl. But in the lines of those fine, faintly smiling lips, of that small, falcon, slightly narrow nose, there was something willful and passionate, something dangerous for herself and others. Astounding, really astounding, were her eyes, dark grey with greenish lights, languishing, almond-shaped as an Egyptian goddess's, with shining lashes and bold sweep of eyebrow. There was a strange look in those eyes. They seemed looking out intently and thoughtfully, looking out from some unknown depth and distance. At school, Irina had been reputed one of the best pupils for intelligence and abilities, but of uneven temper, fond of power, and headstrong. One class mistress prophesied that her passions would be her ruin. Vos passions vous perdrions. On the other hand, another class mistress censured her for her coolness and want of feeling, and called her un jeune fille sans cœur. Irina's companions thought her proud and reserved. Her brothers and sisters stood a little in awe of her. Her mother had no confidence in her, and her father felt ill at ease when she fastened her mysterious eyes upon him. But she inspired a feeling of involuntary respect in both her father and her mother, not so much through her qualities as from a peculiar, vague sense of expectations which she had, in some undefined way, awakened in them. "'You will see Praskova Danielovna,' said the old prince one day, taking his pipe out of his mouth. "'Our chit of an Irina will give us all a lift in the world yet.' The princess got angry, and told her husband that he made use of des expressions insupportables. Afterwards, however, she fell to musing over his words, and repeated through her teeth, Well, and it would be a good thing if we did get a lift. Irina enjoyed almost unlimited freedom in her parents' house. They did not spoil her. They even avoided her a little, but they did not thwart her, and that was all she wanted. Sometimes, during some too humiliating scene, when some tradesman would come and keep shouting, to be heard over the whole court, that he was sick of coming after his money, or their own servants would begin abusing their masters to their face, with, fine princes you are, to be sure, you may whistle for your supper and go hungry to bed. Irina would not stir a muscle. She would sit unmoved, an evil smile on her dark face. And her smile alone was more bitter to her parents than any reproaches, and they felt themselves guilty, guilty though guiltless, towards this being on whom had been bestowed, as it seemed, from her very birth, the right to wealth, to luxury, and to homage. Litvinov fell in love with Irina from the moment he saw her. He was only three years older than she was. But for a long while he failed to obtain not only a response, but even a hearing. Her manner to him was even overcast with a shade of something like hostility. He did in fact wound her pride, and she concealed the wound, and could never forgive it. He was too young and too modest at that time to understand what might be concealed under this hostile, almost contemptuous severity. Often, forgetful of lectures and exercises, he would sit and sit in the Orsinian's cheerless drawing-room stealthily watching Irina, his heart slowly and painfully throbbing, and suffocating him. And she would seem angry or bored, would get up and walk about the room, look coldly at him, as though he were a table or chair, shrug her shoulders and fold her arms. Or for a whole evening, even when talking with Litvinov, she would purposely avoid looking at him, as though denying him even that grace or she would at last take up a book and stare at it, not reading, but frowning and biting her lips, or else she would suddenly ask her father or brother aloud, What's the German for patience? He tried to tear himself away from the enchanted circle in which he suffered and struggled impotently, like a bird in a trap. He went away from Moscow for a week. He nearly went out of his mind with misery and dullness. He returned quite thin and ill to the Orsinians. Strange to say, Irina too had grown perceptibly thinner during those days. Her face had grown pale, her cheeks were wan, but she met him with still greater coldness, 
with almost malignant indifference, as though he had intensified that secret wound he had dealt at her pride. She tortured him in this way for two months. Then everything was transformed in one day. It was as though love had broken into flame with the heat, or had dropped down from a storm-cloud. One day, long will he remember that day, he was once more sitting in the Orsinian's drawing-room at the window, and was looking mechanically into the street. There was vexation and weariness in his heart. He despised himself, and yet he could not move from his place. He thought that if a river ran there under the window, he would throw himself in, with a shudder of fear, but without a regret. Irina placed herself not far from him, and was somehow strangely silent and motionless. For some days now she had not talked to him at all, or to any one else. She kept sitting, leaning on her elbows, as though she were in perplexity, and only rarely she looked slowly round. This cold torture was at last more than Litvinov could bear. He got up, and without saying good-bye, he began to look for his hat. "'Stay!' sounded suddenly in a soft whisper. Litvinov's heart throbbed. He did not at once recognize Irina's voice. In that one word there was a ring of something that had never been in it before. He lifted his head and was stupefied. Irina was looking fondly, yes, fondly at him. "'Stay,' she repeated. "'Don't go. I want to be with you.' Her voice sank lower. "'Don't go. I wish it.' Understanding nothing not fully conscious what he was doing, he drew near her, stretched out his hands, she gave him both of hers at once, then smiling, flushing hotly, she turned away, and still smiling, went out of the room. She came back a few minutes later with her youngest sister, looked at him again with the same prolonged tender gaze, and made him sit near her. At first she could say nothing. She only sighed and blushed. Then she began, timidly, as it were, to question him about his pursuits, a thing she had never done before. In the evening of the same day she tried several times to beg his forgiveness for not having done him justice before, assured him she had now become quite different, astonished him by a sudden outburst of republicanism. He had at that time a positive hero-worship for Robespierre and did not presume to criticize Marat aloud. And only a week later he knew that she loved him. Yes, he long remembered that first day, but he did not forget those that came after either, those days when still forcing himself to doubt, afraid to believe in it, he saw clearly, with transports of rapture, almost of dread, bliss unhoped for coming to life growing, irresistibly carrying everything before it, reaching him at last. Then followed the radiant moments of first love, moments which are not destined to be, but could not fittingly be, repeated in the same life. Irina became all at once as docile as a lamb, as soft as silk, and boundlessly kind. She began giving lessons to her younger sisters, not on the piano, she was no musician, but in French and English. She read their school-books with them, and looked after the housekeeping. Everything was amusing and interesting to her. She would sometimes chatter incessantly, and sometimes sink into speechless tenderness. She made all sorts of plans, and was lost in endless anticipation of what she would do when she was married to Litvinov. They never doubted that their marriage would come to pass and how together they would... work? prompted Litvinov. Yes, work, repeated Irina, and read, but travel before all things. She particularly wanted to leave Moscow as soon as possible, and when Litvinov reminded her that he had not yet finished his course of study at the university, she always replied, after a moment's thought, that it was quite possible to finish his studies at Berlin, or somewhere or other. Irina was very little reserved in the expression of her feelings, and so her relations with Litvinov did not long remain a secret from the prince and princess. Rejoice they could not, 
but, taking all circumstances into consideration, they saw no necessity for putting a veto on it at once. Litvinov's fortune was considerable. But his family! His family! protested the princess. Yes, his family, of course, replied the prince. But at least he's not quite a plebeian. And what's the principal point? Irina, you know, will not listen to us. Has there ever been a time when she did not do what she chose? Who can say sa violence? Besides, there is nothing fixed definitely yet. So reasoned the prince, but mentally he added, however, Madame Litvinov, is that all? I had expected something else. Irina took complete possession of her future fiancé, and indeed he himself eagerly surrendered himself into her hands. It was as if he had fallen into a rapid river and had lost himself. And bitter and sweet it was to him, and he regretted nothing and heeded nothing. To reflect on the significance and the duties of marriage, or whether he, so hopelessly enslaved, could be a good husband, and what sort of wife Irina would make, and whether their relations to one another were what they should be, was more than he could bring himself to. His blood was on fire. He could think of nothing, only to follow her, be with her, for the future without end, and then let come what may. But in spite of the complete absence of opposition on Litvinov's side, and the wealth of impulsive tenderness on Irina's, they did not get on quite without any misunderstandings and quarrels. One day he ran to her straight from the university in an old coat and ink-stained hands. She rushed to meet him with her accustomed fond welcome. Suddenly she stopped short. "'You have no gloves,' she said abruptly, and added directly after, "'Fie! What a student you are!' "'You are too particular, Irina,' remarked Litvinov. "'You are a regular student,' she repeated. "'Vous n'est pas distingué?' And turning her back on him, she went out of the room. It is true that an hour later she begged him to forgive her. As a rule she readily censured herself and accused herself to him. But, strange to say, she often almost with tears blamed herself for evil propensities which she had not, and obstinately denied her real defects. Another time he found her in tears, her head in her hands, and her hair in disorder. And when, all in agitation, he asked her the cause of her grief, she pointed with her finger at her own bosom without speaking. Litvinov gave an involuntary shiver. Consumption! flashed through his brain, and he seized her hand. Are you ill, Irina? he articulated in a shaking voice. They had already begun on great occasions to call each other by their first names. Let me go at once for a doctor. But Irina did not let him finish. She stamped with her foot in vexation. "'I am perfectly well. But this dress, don't you understand?' "'What is it, this dress?' he repeated in bewilderment. "'What is it? Why, that I have no other, and that it is old and disgusting, and I am obliged to put on this dress every day, even when you, Grisha Grigori, come here. You will leave off loving me at last, seeing me so slovenly.' "'For goodness sake, Irina, what are you saying? That dress is very nice. It is dear to me, too, because I saw you for the first time in it, darling.' Irina blushed. "'Do not remind me, if you please, Grigory Mikhailovitch, that I had no other dress even then.' "'But I assure you, Irina Pavlovna, it suits you so exquisitely.' "'No, it is horrid, horrid.' she persisted, nervously pulling at her long, soft curls. Ah, oh, this poverty, poverty and squalor! How is one to escape from this sordidness? How get out of this squalor? Litvinov did not know what to say, and slightly turned away from her. All at once Irina jumped up from her chair, and laid both her hands on his shoulders. "'But do you love me, Grisha? You love me?' she murmured putting her face close to him, and her eyes, still filled with tears, sparkled with the light of happiness. "'You love me, dear, even in this horrid dress?' 
Litvinov flung himself on his knees before her. Ah, love me, love me, my sweet, my saviour, she whispered, bending over him. So the days flew, the weeks passed, and though as yet there had been no formal declaration, though Litvinov still deferred his demand for her hand, not certainly at his own desire, but awaiting directions from Irina. She remarked sometimes that they were both ridiculously young, and they must add at least a few weeks more to their years. Still everything was moving to a conclusion, and the future as it came nearer grew more and more clearly defined. When suddenly an event occurred, which scattered all their dreams and plans like light roadside dust. End of chapter 7 Chapter Eight of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight. That winter the court visited Moscow. One festivity followed another. In its turn came the customary great ball in the hall of nobility. The news of this ball only, it is true, in the form of an announcement in the political gazette, reached even the little house in Dog's place. The prince was the first to be roused by it. He decided at once that he must not fail to go and take Irina, that it would be unpardonable to let slip the opportunity of seeing their sovereigns, that for the old nobility this constituted indeed a duty in its own way. He defended his opinion with a peculiar warmth, not habitual in him. The princess agreed with him to some extent, and only sighed over the expense but a resolute opposition was displayed by Irina. "'It is not necessary. I will not go,' she replied to all her parents' arguments. Her obstinacy reached such proportions that the old prince decided at last to beg Litvinov to try to persuade her, by reminding her, among other reasons, that it was not proper for a young girl to avoid society, that she ought to have this experience that no one ever saw her anywhere as it was. Litvinov undertook to lay these reasons before her. Irina looked steadily and scrutinizingly at him, so steadily and scrutinizingly, that he was confused, and then, playing with the ends of her sash, she said calmly, "'Do you desire it, you?' "'Yes, I suppose so,' replied Litvinov hesitatingly. I agree with your papa. Indeed, why should you not go, to see the world and show yourself?" he added with a short laugh. "'To show myself,' she repeated slowly. "'Very well, then, I will go. Only remember, it is you yourself who desired it.' "'That's to say I—' Litvinov was beginning. "'You yourself have desired it,' she interposed. "'And here is one condition more. You must promise me that you will not be at this ball. But why? I wish it to be so. Litvinov unclasped his hands. I submit, but I confess I should so have enjoyed seeing you in all your grandeur, witnessing the sensation you are certain to make. How proud I should be of you, he added with a sigh. Irina laughed. All the grandeur will consist of a white frock, and as for the sensation, well, anyway, I wish it. Irina, darling, you seem to be angry? Irina laughed again. Oh, no, I am not angry, only Grisha. She fastened her eyes on him, and he thought he had never before seen such an expression in them. Perhaps it must be, she added in an undertone. But, Irina, you love me, dear? I love you, she answered with almost solemn gravity and she clasped his hand firmly like a man. All the following days Irina was busily occupied over her dress and her coiffure. On the day before the ball she felt unwell, she could not sit still, and twice she burst into tears in solitude. Before Litvinov she wore the same uniform smile. She treated him, however, with her old tenderness, but carelessly, and was constantly looking at herself in the glass. On the day of the ball she was silent and pale, but collected. At nine o'clock in the evening Litvinov came to look at her. 
when she came to meet him in a white tarlatan gown with a spray of small blue flowers in her slightly raised hair he almost uttered a cry she seemed to him so lovely and stately beyond what was natural to her years yes she has grown up since this morning he thought and how she holds herself that's what race does irina stood before him her hands hanging loose without smiles or affectation and looked resolutely almost boldly not at him but away into the distance straight before her you are just like a princess in a story-book said litvinov at last you are like a warrior before the battle before victory you did not allow me to go to this ball he went on while she remained motionless as before not because she was not listening to him but because she was following another inner voice but you will not refuse to accept and take with you these flowers he offered her a bunch of heliotrope she looked quickly at litvinov stretched out her hand and suddenly seizing the end of the spray which decorated her hair she said do you wish it grisha only say the word and i will tear off all this and stop at home litvinov's heart seemed fairly bursting irina's hand had already snatched the spray no no what for he interposed hurriedly in a rush of generous and magnanimous feeling i am not an egoist why should i restrict your freedom when i know that your heart well don't come near me you will crush my dress she said hastily litvinov was disturbed but you will take the nosegay he asked of course it is very pretty and i love that scent merci i shall keep it in memory of your first coming out observed litvinov your first triumph irina looked over her shoulder at herself in the glass scarcely bending her figure and do i really look so nice you are not partial litvinov overflowed in enthusiastic praises irina was already not listening to him and holding the flowers up to her face she was again looking away into the distance with her strange as it were overshadowed dilated eyes and the ends of her delicate ribbons stirred by a faint current of air rose slightly behind her shoulders like wings the prince made his appearance his hair well be curled in a white tie and a shabby black evening coat with the medal of nobility on a vladimir ribbon in his buttonhole after him came the princess in a china silk dress of antique cut and with the anxious severity under which mothers try to conceal their agitation set her daughter to rights behind that is to say quite needlessly shook out the folds of her gown an antiquated hired coach with seats for four drawn by two shaggy hacks crawled up to the steps its wheels grating over the frozen mounds of unswept snow and a decrepit groom in a most unlikely-looking livery came running out of the passage and with a sort of desperate courage announced that the carriage was ready after giving a blessing for the night to the children left at home and enfolding themselves in their fur wraps the prince and princess went out to the steps irina in a little cloak too thin and too short how she hated the little cloak at that moment followed them in silence litvinov escorted them outside hoping for a last look from irina but she took her seat in the carriage without turning her head about midnight he walked under the windows of the hall of nobility countless lights of huge candelabra shone with brilliant radiance through the red curtains and the whole square blocked with carriages was ringing with the insolent festive seductive strains of a waltz of strauss the next day at one o'clock litvinov betook himself to the osinians he found no one at home but the prince who informed him at once that irina had a headache that she was in bed and would not get up till the evening that such an indisposition was however little to be wondered at after a first ball c'est très naturel vous savez dans les jeunes filles he added in french somewhat to litvinov's surprise the latter observed at the same instant that the prince was not in his dressing-gown as usual but was wearing a coat and besides continued osinin 
she may well be a little upset after the events of yesterday events muttered litvinov yes yes events events de vrais événements you cannot imagine grigory mikhailovitch quel succès elle a you the whole court noticed her prince alexander fedorovitch said that her place was not here and that she reminded him of countess devonshire you know that celebrated and old blazenkrampf declared in the hearing of all that irina was la graine du bal and desired to be introduced to her he was introduced to me too that's to say he told me that he remembered me a hussar and asked me where i was holding office now most entertaining man that count and such an adugrator du beau sexe but that's not all my princess they gave her no peace either natalia nikitishna herself conversed with her what more could we have irina danced avec tous les meilleurs cavaliers they kept bringing them to me i positively lost count of them would you believe it they were all flocking about us in crowds in the mazurka they did nothing but seek her out one foreign diplomatist hearing she was a moscow girl said to the tsar sire decidément c'est moscou qui le centre de votre empire and another diplomatist added c'est une vraie révolution sur révolution ou révolution something of that sort yes yes it was i tell you it was something extraordinary well and irina pavlovna herself inquired litvinov whose hands and feet had grown cold hearing the prince's speech did she enjoy herself did she seem pleased of course she enjoyed herself how could she fail to be pleased but as you know she's not to be seen through at a glance every one was saying to me yesterday it is really surprising jamais on ne dirait que mademoiselle votre fille est à son premier bal count riesenbach among the rest you know him most likely no i don't know him at all and have never heard of him my wife's cousin i don't know him a rich man a chamberlain living in petersburg in the swim of things in livonia every one is in his hands hitherto he has neglected us but there i don't bear him ill will for that j'ai l'humeur voici comme vous savez well that's the kind of man he is he sat near irina conversed with her for a quarter of an hour not more and said afterwards to my princess ma cousine he says votre fille est une perle c'est une perfection every one is congratulating me on such a niece and afterwards i look round and he had gone up to a a very great personage and was talking and kept looking at irina and the personage was looking at her too and so irina pavlovna will not appear all day litvinov asked again quite so her head aches very badly she told me to greet you from her and thank you for your flowers qu'on a trouvé charmant she needs rest the princess has gone out on a round of visits and i myself you see the prince cleared his throat and began to fidget as though he were at a loss what to add further litvinov took his hat and saying he did not want to disturb him and would call again later to inquire after her health he went away a few steps from the osinians house he saw an elegant carriage for two persons standing before the police sentry-box a groom in livery equally elegant was bending negligently from the box and inquiring of the finnish police sergeant whereabouts prince pavel vasilievich osinian lived litvinov glanced at the carriage in it sat a middle-aged man of bloated complexion with a wrinkled and haughty face a greek nose and an evil mouth muffled in a sable wrap by all outward signs a very great man indeed End of chapter eight chapter nine of smoke by ivan turgenev 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Litvinov did not keep his promise of returning later. He reflected that it would be better to defer his visit till the following day. When he went into the too familiar drawing-room at about twelve o'clock, he found there the two youngest princesses, Viktorinka and Kleopatrinka. He greeted them, and then inquired, Was Irina Pavlovna better, and could he see her? Irinochka hath gone away with Mammy, replied Viktorinka. She lisped a little, but was more forward than her sister. How? Gone away? repeated Litvinov and there was a sort of still shudder in the very bottom of his heart. "'Does she not, do, does she not look after you about this time and give you your lessons?' "'Irinochka will not give us any lessons any more now,' answered Viktorinka. "'Not any more now,' Kleopatrinka repeated after her. "'Is your papa at home?' asked Litvinov. "'Papa is not at home,' continued Viktorinka and Irinochka is not well. All night she was crying and crying." "'Crying?' "'Yes, crying. Yegorovna told me, and her eyes are so red, they are quite inflamed.' Litvinov walked twice up and down the room shuddering as though with cold, and went back to his lodging. He experienced a sensation like that which gains possession of a man when he looks down from a high tower. Everything failed within him and his head was swimming slowly with a sense of nausea. Dull stupefaction, and thoughts scurrying like mice, vague terror, and the numbness of expectation, and curiosity, strange, almost malignant, and the weight of crushed tears in his heavy-laden breast, on his lips the forced empty smile, and a meaningless prayer, addressed to no one. Oh, how bitter it all was, and how hideously degrading! Irina does not want to see me, was the thought that was incessantly revolving in his brain. So much is clear, but why is it? What can have happened at that ill-fated ball? And how is such a change possible all at once? So suddenly! People always see death coming suddenly, but they can never get accustomed to its suddenness. They feel it senseless. She sends no message for me, does not want to explain herself to me. Grigory Mikhailitch called a strained voice positively in his ear. Litvinov started, and saw before him his servant with a note in his hand. He recognized Irina's writing. Before he had broken the seal he had a foreknowledge of woe, and bent his head on his breast and hunched his shoulders, as though shrinking from the blow. He plucked up courage at last, and tore open the envelope all at once. On a small sheet of note-paper were the following lines. Forgive me, Grigory Mikhailitch. All is over between us. I am going away to Petersburg. I am dreadfully unhappy, but the thing is done. It seems my fate. But no, I do not want to justify myself. My presentiments have been realized. Forgive me, forget me. I am not worthy of you. Irina. Be magnanimous. Do not try to see me. Litvinov read these five lines, and slowly dropped on to the sofa, as though someone had dealt him a blow on the breast. He dropped the note, picked it up, read it again, whispered, To Petersburg, and dropped it again. That was all. There even came upon him a sense of peace. He even, with his hands thrown behind him, smoothed the pillow under his head. Men wounded to death don't fling themselves about he thought. As it has come, so it has gone. All this is natural enough. I always expected it. He was lying to himself. He had never expected anything like it. Crying? Was she crying? What was she crying for? Why, she did not love me. But all that is easily understood and in accordance with her character. She, she is not worthy of me. That's it. He laughed bitterly. She did not know herself what power was latent in her. Well, convinced of it in her effect at the ball, was it likely she would stay with an insignificant student? All that's easily understood. 
but then he remembered her tender words her smile and those eyes those never to be forgotten eyes which he would never see again which used to shine and melt at simply meeting his eyes he recalled one swift timorous burning kiss and suddenly he fell to sobbing sobbing convulsively furiously vindictively turned over on his face and choking and stifling with frenzied satisfaction as though thirsting to tear himself to pieces with all around him he turned his hot face in the sofa pillow and bit it in his teeth alas the gentleman whom litvinov had seen the day before in the carriage was no other than the cousin of the princess osinin the rich chamberlain count reisenbach noticing the sensation produced by irina on certain personages of the highest rank and instantaneously reflecting what advantages might meet et à courtesse be derived from the fact the count made his plan at once like a man of energy and a skilful courtier he decided to act swiftly in napoleonic style i will take that original girl into my house was what he meditated in petersburg i will make her my heiress devil take me of my whole property even as i have no children she is my niece and my countess is dull all alone it's always more agreeable to have a pretty face in one's drawing-room yes yes that's it es ist eine idee es ist eine idee he would have to dazzle bewilder and impress the parents they've not enough to eat the count pursued his reflection when he was in the carriage and on his way to dog's place so i warrant they won't be obstinate they're not such over-sentimental folks either i might give them a sum of money down into the bargain and she she will consent honey is sweet she had a taste of it last night it's a whim on my part granted let them profit by it the fools i shall say to them one thing and another and you must decide otherwise i shall adopt another an orphan which would be still more suitable yes or no twenty-four hours i fix for the term und damit punctum and with these very words on his lips the count presented himself before the prince whom he had forewarned of his visit the evening before at the ball on the result of this visit it seems hardly worth while to enlarge further the count was not mistaken in his prognostications the prince and princess were in fact not obstinate and accepted the sum of money and irina did in fact consent before the allotted term had expired it was not easy for her to break off her relations with litvinov she loved him and after sending him her note she almost kept her bed weeping continually and grew thin and wan but for all that a month later the princess carried her off to petersburg and established her at the count's committing her to the care of the countess a very kind-hearted woman but with the brain of a hen and something of a hen's exterior litvinov threw up the university and went home to his father in the country little by little his wound healed at first he had no news of irina and indeed he avoided all conversation that touched on petersburg and petersburg society later on by degrees rumours not evil exactly but curious began to circulate about her gossip began to be busy about her the name of the young princess osinin encircled in splendour impressed with quite a special stamp began to be more and more frequently mentioned even in provincial circles it was pronounced with curiosity respect and envy as men at one time used to mention the name of the countess borotinsky at last the news came of her marriage but litvinov hardly paid attention to these last tidings he was already betrothed to tatyana now the reader can no doubt easily understand exactly what it was litvinov recalled when he cried can it be she and therefore we will return to baden and take up again the broken thread of our story end of chapter nine Chapter Ten of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten. 
Litvinov fell asleep very late, and did not sleep long. The sun had only just risen when he got out of bed. The summits of dark mountains, visible from his windows, stood out in misty purple against the clear sky. How cool it must be there under the trees, he thought, and he dressed in haste, and looked with indifference at the bouquet which had opened more luxuriantly after the night. He took a stick and set off towards the old castle on the famous cliffs. Invigorating and soothing was the caressing contact of the fresh morning about him. He drew long breaths, and stepped out boldly. The vigorous health of youth was throbbing in every vein. The very earth seemed springy under his light feet. With every step he grew more light-hearted, more happy. He walked in the dewy shade, in the thick sand of the little paths, beside the fir-trees that were fringed with the vivid green of the spring shoots at the end of every twig. "'How jolly it is!' he kept repeating to himself. Suddenly he heard the sound of familiar voices. He looked ahead and saw Voroshilov and Bombeyev coming to meet him. The sight of them jarred upon him. He rushed away like a schoolboy, avoiding his teacher, and hid himself behind a bush. "'My creator,' he prayed, "'mercifully remove my countrymen.' He felt that he would not have grudged any money at the moment if only they did not see him and they actually did not see him. The Creator was merciful to him. Voroshilov, in his self-confident military voice, was holding forth to Bombeyev on the various phases of Gothic architecture, and Bombeyev only grunted approvingly. It was obvious that Voroshilov had been dinning his phrases into him a long while, and the good-natured enthusiast was beginning to be bored. Compressing his lips and craning his neck, Litvinov listened a long while to their retreating footsteps. For a long time the accents of instructive discourse, now guttural, now nasal, reached his ears. At last all was still again. Litvinov breathed freely, came out of his ambush, and walked on. For three hours he wandered about the mountains. Sometimes he left the path and jumped from rock to rock, slipping now and then on the smooth moss. Then he would sit down on a fragment of the cliff under an oak or a beach, and muse on pleasant fancies to the never-ceasing gurgle of the little rills overgrown with ferns, the soothing rustle of the leaves, and the shrill notes of a solitary blackbird. A light and equally pleasant drowsiness began to steal over him. It seemed to approach him caressingly, and he dropped asleep. But suddenly he smiled and looked round. The gold and green of the forest and the moving foliage beat down softly on his eyes, and again he smiled and again closed them. He began to want breakfast, and he made his way towards the old castle where for a few kreutzers he could get a glass of good milk and coffee. But he had hardly had time to establish himself at one of the little white-painted tables set on the platform before the castle when the heavy tramping of horses was heard, and three open carriages drove up, out of which stepped a rather numerous company of ladies and gentlemen. Litvinov at once recognized them as Russians, though they were all talking French, just because they were all talking French. The ladies' dresses were marked by a studied elegance. The gentlemen wore close-fitting coats with waists, which is not altogether usual nowadays, grey trousers of fancy material, and very glossy town hats. A narrow black cravat closely fettered the neck of each of these gentlemen, and something military was apparent in their whole deportment. They were, in fact, military men. Litvinov had chanced upon a picnic party of young generals, persons of the highest society, of weight and importance. Their importance was clearly expressed in everything in their discreet nonchalance, in their amiably condescending smiles, in the intense indifference of their expression, the effeminate little movements of their shoulders, the swing of the figure, and the crook of the knees. It was expressed, too, in the sound of their voices, which seemed to be affably and fastidiously thanking a subservient multitude. All these officers were superlatively washed and shaved, and thoroughly saturated with that genuine aroma of nobility and the guards, 
compounded of the best cigar smoke and the most marvellous patchouli. They all had the hands too of noblemen, white and large, with nails firm as ivory, their moustaches seemed positively polished, their teeth shone, and their skin, rosy on their cheeks, bluish on their chins, was most delicate and fine. Some of the young generals were frivolous, others were serious but the stamp of the best breeding was on all of them. Each of them seemed to be deeply conscious of his own dignity, and the importance of his own future part in the government, and conducted himself with severity and ease, with a faint shade of that carelessness, that deuce-take-it air, which comes out so naturally during foreign travel. The party seated themselves with much noise and ostentation, and called the obsequious waiters. Litvinov made haste to drink off his glass of milk, paid for it, and, putting his hat on, was just making off past the party of generals. "'Grigory Mikhailitch!' he heard a woman's voice. "'Don't you recognize me?' He stopped involuntarily. That voice! That voice had too often set his heart beating in the past. He turned round and saw Irina. She was sitting at a table, her arms folded on the back of a chair drawn up near. With her head bent on one side and a smile on her face, she was looking at him cordially, almost with delight. Litvinov knew her at once, though she had changed since he saw her that last time ten years ago, though she had been transformed from a girl into a woman. Her slim figure had developed and reached its perfection. The lines of her once narrow shoulders now recalled the goddesses that stand out on the ceilings of ancient Italian palaces. But her eyes remained the same, and it seemed to Litvinov that they were looking at him just as in those days in the little house in Moscow. "'Irina Pavlovna,' he uttered irresolutely, "'you know me. How glad I am! How glad!' She stopped short, slightly blushing, and drew herself up. "'This is a very pleasant meeting,' she continued now in French. "'Let me introduce you to my husband, Valerian, Monsieur Litvinov, un ami d'enfance, Valerian Vladimirovich Radmirov, my husband.' One of the young generals, almost the most elegant of all, got up from his seat, and with excessive courtesy bowed to Litvinov while the rest of his companions faintly knitted their brows, or rather, each of them withdrew for an instant into himself, as though protesting betimes against any contact with an extraneous civilian, and the other ladies taking part in the picnic thought fit to screw up their eyes a little, and simper, and even to assume an air of perplexity. "'Have you, er, uh, been long in Baden?' asked General Ratmirov with a dandified air utterly un-Russian. He obviously did not know what to talk about with the friend of his wife's childhood. "'No, not long,' replied Litvinov. "'And do you intend to stay long?' pursued the polite general. "'I have not made up my mind yet.' "'Ah, that is very delightful, very!' The general paused. Litvinov, too, was speechless. Both held their hats in their hands, and, bending forward with a grin, gazed at the top of each other's heads. Du gentam un po dimash, began humming, out of tune, of course, we have never come across a Russian nobleman who did not sing out of tune, a dull-eyed and yellow-faced general, with an expression of constant irritability on his face, as though he could not forgive himself for his own appearance. Among all his companions, he alone had not the complexion of a rose. "'But why don't you sit down, Grigory Mikhailitch? observed Irina at last. Litvinov obeyed and sat down. "'I say, Valerian, give me some fire,' remarked in English another general, also young, but already stout, with fixed eyes which seemed staring into the air, and thick silky whiskers, into which he slowly plunged his snow-white fingers. Ratmirov gave him a silver match-box. "'Avez-vous des papiers?' asked one of the ladies with a lisp. "'De vrais papillitos, comtesse.' "'Do gendarme un bon dimanche,' the dull-eyed general hummed again, 
with intense exasperation. "'You must be sure to come and see us,' Irina was saying to Litvinov meantime. "'We are staying at the Hotel de l'Europa. From four to six I am always at home. We have not seen each other for such a long time.' Litvinov looked at Irina. She did not drop her eyes. "'Yes, Irina Pavlovna, it is a long time. Ever since we were at Moscow.' at moscow yes at moscow she repeated abruptly come and see me we will talk and recall old times do you know grigory mikhailitch you have not changed much really but you have changed irina pavlovna i have grown older no i did not mean that irenya said a lady in a yellow hat with yellow hair in an interrogative voice after some preliminary whispering and giggling with the officer sitting near her irenya i am older pursued irina without answering the lady but i am not changed no no i am changed in nothing du gendarme un beau dimanche was heard again the irritable general only remembered the first line of the well-known ditty it still pricks a little, Your Excellency," observed the stout general with the whiskers, with a loud and broad intonation, apparently quoting from some amusing story, well known to the whole beau monde. And with a short wooden laugh he again fell to staring into the air. All the rest of the party laughed too. "'What a sad dog you are, Boris,' observed Ratmirov in an undertone. He spoke in English and pronounced even the name Boris as if it were English. Irina? the lady in the yellow hat said inquiringly for the third time. Irina turned sharply round to her. Eh bien, quoi? Que me voulez-vous? Je vous dirai plus tard, replied the lady, mincing. With a very unattractive exterior, she was for ever mincing and grimacing some wit said of her that she minudait dans le vide grimaced upon the desert air irina frowned and shrugged her shoulders impatiently mais que fait donc monsieur verdier pourquoi ne vient il pas cried one lady with that prolonged drawl which is the peculiarity of the great russian accent and is so insupportable to french ears ah vous ah vous monsieur verdu monsieur verdu sighed another lady whose birthplace was arzamas tranquille vous madame interposed ratmirov monsieur verder mou promis de venir se mettre à vos pieds <laughs> the ladies fluttered their fans the waiter brought some glasses of beer Berish beer inquired the general with whiskers assuming a bass voice, and affecting astonishment. Guten Morgen! Well, is Count Pavel still there? One young general inquired coldly and listlessly of another. Yes, replied the other equally coldly. They say provisoire. Serge, they say, will be put in his place. Aha! Uh -huh, filtered the first through his teeth. Ah, yes, filtered the second. I can't understand, began the general who had hummed the song, I can't understand what induced Paul to defend himself, to bring forward all sorts of reasons. Certainly he crushed the merchant pretty well. Il lui a fait grandre garge. Well, and what of it? He may have had his own motives. He was afraid of being shown up in the newspapers, muttered someone the irritable general grew hot. "'Well, it is too much. Newspapers! Shown up! If it depended on me, I would not let anything be printed in those papers but the taxes on meat or bread, and announcements of sales of boots or furs.' "'And gentlemen's properties up for auction,' put in Ratmirov. "'Possibly, under present circumstances. What a conversation, though, in Baden au vieux Chateau mais pas du tout pas du tout replied the lady in the yellow hat j'adore les questions politiques madame a raison 
interposed another general with an exceedingly pleasant and girlish-looking face. Why should we avoid those questions, even in Baden? As he said these words, he looked urbanely at Litvinov and smiled condescendingly. A man of honour ought never under any circumstances to disown his convictions, don't you think so? Of course, rejoined the irritable general, darting a look at Litvinov, and, as it were, indirectly attacking him. But I don't see the necessity. No, no, the condescending general interposed with the same mildness. Your friend, Valerian Vladimirovitch, just referred to the sale of gentlemen's estates. Well, is it not a fact? But it's impossible to sell them nowadays. Nobody wants them, cried the irritable general. Perhaps, perhaps. For that very reason we ought to proclaim that fact, that sad fact, at every step. We are ruined. Very good. We are beggared. There's no disputing about that. But we, the great owners, we still represent a principle, un principe. To preserve that principle is our duty. Pardon, madame, I think you dropped your handkerchief. When some, so to say, darkness has come over even the highest minds, we ought submissively to point out, the general held out his finger, with the finger of a citizen the abyss to which everything is tending. We ought to warn, we ought to say with respectful firmness, turn back, turn back, that is what we ought to say. There's no turning back altogether, though, observed Ratmirov moodily. The condescending general only grinned. Yes, altogether, altogether, mon très cher. The further back, the better. The general again looked courteously at Litvinov. The latter could not stand it. Are we to return as far as the seven boyars, your excellency? Why not? I express my opinion without hesitation. We must undo, yes, undo all that has been done. And the emancipation of the serfs and the emancipation, as far as that is possible. On ne patriotu, on ne lepa. And freedom, they say to me, do you suppose that freedom is prized by the people? Ask them. Just try, broke in Litvinov, taking that freedom away again. Comment nommez-vous, ces monsieur? whispered the general to Ratmirov. What are you discussing here? began the stout general suddenly. He obviously played the part of the spoiled child of the party. Is it all about the newspapers? About penny a -liners? Let me tell you a little anecdote of what happened to me with a scribbling fellow. Such a lovely thing! I was told he had written a libel on me. Well, of course, I at once had him brought before me. They brought me the penny a -liner. How was it? said I, my dear chap, you came to write this libel. Was your patriotism too much for you? Yes, it was too much, says he. Well, says I, and do you like money? Yes, says he. Then, gentlemen, I gave him the knob of my cane to sniff at. And do you like that, my angel? No, says he. I don't like that. But sniff it as you ought, says I. My hands are clean. I don't like it, says he, and that's all. But I like it very much, my angel, says I, though not for myself. Do you understand that allegory, my treasure? Yes, says he. Then mind, and be a good boy for the future. And now here's a rouble sterling for you. Go away and be grateful to me night and day. And so the scribbling chap went off. The general burst out laughing, and again every one followed his example. Every one except Irina who did not even smile, and looked darkly at the speaker. The condescending general slapped Boris on the shoulder. "'That's all your invention, O oh friend of my bosom, you threatening any one with a stick. You haven't got a stick. Say pour faire say dame, for the sake of a good story. But that's not the point. I said just now that we must turn back completely. Understand me. I am not hostile to so-called progress, but all these universities and seminaries, and popular schools, these students, priests' sons, and commoners, 
all these small fry to say fond du sac la petite propriété pirculu proletaire the general uttered this in a languishing almost faint voice voilà ce qui me fait that's where one ought to draw the line and make other people draw it too again he gave litvinov a genial glance yes one must draw the line don't forget that among us no one makes any demand no one is asking for anything local government for instance who asks for that do you ask for it or you or you or you madame you rule not only yourselves but all of us you know the general's handsome face was lighted up by a smile of amusement my dear friends why should we curry favour with the multitude you like democracy it flatters you and serves your ends but you know it's a double weapon it is better in the old way as before far more secure don't deign to reason with the herd trust in the aristocracy that alone is power indeed it will be better and progress i certainly have nothing against progress only don't give us lawyers and sworn juries and elective officials only don't touch discipline discipline before all things you may build bridges and quays and hospitals and why not light the streets with gas petersburg has been set on fire from one end to the other so there you have your progress hissed the irritable general yes you're a mischievous fellow i can see said the stout general shaking his head lazily you would do for a chief prosecutor but in my opinion avec orfei aux enfers le progrès a de son dernier mot vous dites toujours des bêtises giggled the lady from arzamas the general looked dignified zen sous jamais plus sérieux madame que quand je dis des bêtises monsieur verdier has uttered that very phrase several times already observed irina in a low voice de la pointe et du fond cried the stout general de la poigne surtout and to translate into russian be civil but don't spare your fists ah you're a rascal an incorrigible rascal interposed the condescending general madame don't listen to him please a barking dog does not bite he cares for nothing but flirtation that's not right though boris began ratmirov after exchanging a glance with his wife it's all very well to be mischievous but that's going too far progress is a phenomenon of social life and this is what we must not forget it's a symptom it's what we must watch all right i say observed the stout general wrinkling up his nose we all know you are aiming at the ministry not at all the ministry indeed but really one can't refuse to recognize things boris plunged his fingers again into his whiskers and stared into the air social life is very important because in the development of the people in the destinies so to speak of the country valerian interrupted boris reprovingly il y a de dames ici i did not expect this of you or do you want to get on to a committee but they are all closed now thank god put in the irritable general and he began humming again du gendarme un beau dimanche ratmirov raised a cambric handkerchief to his nose and gracefully retired from the discussion the condescending general repeated rascal rascal but boris turned to the lady who grimaced upon the desert air and without lowering his voice or a change in the expression of his face began to ply her with questions as to when she would reward his devotion as though he were desperately in love with her and suffering tortures on her account at every moment during this conversation litvinov felt more and more ill at ease his pride his clean plebeian pride was fairly in revolt what had he the son of a petty official in common with these military aristocrats of petersburg he loved everything they hated he hated everything they loved he was only too vividly conscious of it he felt it in every part of his being their jokes he thought dull their tone intolerable 
every gesture false. In the very smoothness of their speeches he detected a note of revolting contemptuousness, and yet he was, as it were, abashed before them, before these creatures, these enemies. Ah, oh, how disgusting! I am in their way, I am ridiculous to them, was the thought that kept revolving in his head. Why am I stopping? Let me escape at once, at once! Irina's presence could not retain him. She, too, aroused melancholy emotions in him. He got up from his seat and began to take leave. "'You are going already?' said Irina. But after a moment's reflection she did not press him to stay, and only extracted a promise from him that he would not fail to come and see her. General Radmirov took leave of him with the same refined courtesy shook hands with him, and accompanied him to the end of the platform. But Litvinov had scarcely had time to turn round the first bend in the road, when he heard a general roar of laughter behind him. This laughter had no reference to him, but was occasioned by the long-expected Monsieur Verdier, who suddenly made his appearance on the platform, in a Tyrolese hat and blue blouse, riding a donkey but the blood fairly rushed into Litvinov's cheeks, and he felt intense bitterness. His tightly compressed lips seemed as though drawn by wormwood. "'Despicable, vulgar creatures!' he muttered, without reflecting that the few minutes he had spent in their company had not given him sufficient ground for such severe criticism. And this was the world into which Irina had fallen. Irina, once his Irina! In this world she moved, and lived, and reigned. For it she had sacrificed her personal dignity, the noblest feelings of her heart. It was clearly as it should be. It was clear that she had deserved no better fate. How glad he was that she had not thought of questioning him about his intentions. He might have opened his heart before them, in their presence. "'For nothing in the world, never,' murmured Litvinov inhaling deep draughts of the fresh air and descending the road towards Baden almost at a run. He thought of his betrothed, his sweet, good, sacred Tatyana, and how pure, how noble, how true she seemed to him. With what unmixed tenderness he recalled her features, her words, her very gestures. With what impatience he looked forward to her return. The rapid exercise soothed his nerves. Returning home, he sat down at the table and took up a book. Suddenly he let it fall, even with a shudder. What had happened to him? Nothing had happened but Irina, Irina. All at once his meeting with her seemed something marvellous, strange, extraordinary. Was it possible? He had met, he had talked with the same Irina. And why was there no trace in her of that hateful worldliness? which was so sharply stamped upon all these others. Why did he fancy that she seemed, as it were, weary, or sad, or sick of her position? She was in their camp, but she was not an enemy. And what could have impelled her to receive him joyfully, to invite him to see her? Litvinov started. "'Oh, Tanya, Tanya!' he cried passionately. "'You are my guardian angel, you only, my good genius. I love you only, and will love you for ever. And I will not go to see her. Forget her altogether. Let her amuse herself with her generals." Litvinov set to his book again. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Smoke by Ivan Turgenev this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. CHAPTER Eleven. Litvinov took up his book again, but he could not read. He went out of the house, walked a little, listened to the music, glanced in at the gambling, returned again to his room, and tried again to read, still without success. The time seemed to drag by with peculiar dreariness. Pishchalkin, the well-intentioned peaceable mediator, came in and sat with him for three hours. He talked, argued, stated questions, and discoursed intermittently, first of elevated and then of practical topics, and succeeded in diffusing around him such an atmosphere of dullness that poor Litvinov was ready to cry. 
in raising dullness agonizing chilling helpless hopeless dullness to a fine art pishchalkin was absolutely unrivalled even among persons of the highest morality who are notoriously masters in that line the mere sight of his well-cut and well-brushed head his clear lifeless eyes his benevolent nose produced an involuntary despondency and his deliberate drowsy lazy tone seemed to have been created only to state with conviction and lucidity such sententious truths as that twice two makes four and not five or three that water is liquid and benevolence laudable that to the private individual no less than to the state and to the state no less than to the private individual credit is absolutely indispensable for financial operations and with all this he was such an excellent man but such is the sentence the fates have passed on russia among us good men are dull pishchalkin retreated at last he was replaced by bindasov who without any beating about the bush asked litvinov with great effrontery for a loan of a hundred guldens and the latter gave it to him in spite of the fact that bindasov was not only unattractive but even repulsive to him that he knew for certain that he would never get his money back and was besides himself in need of it what made him give him the money then the reader will inquire who can tell that is another russian weakness let the reader lay his hand on his heart and remember how many acts in his own life have had absolutely no other reason and Binzasov did not even thank Litvinov. He asked for a glass of red bodden wine, and, without wiping his lips, departed, loudly and offensively tramping with his boots. And how vexed Litvinov was with himself already, as he watched the red nape of the retreating sharper's neck. Before evening he received a letter from Tatyana, in which she informed him that as her aunt was not well she would not come to Baden for five or six days. This news had a depressing influence on Litvinov. It increased his vexation, and he went to bed early in a disagreeable frame of mind. The following day turned out no better, if not worse, than the preceding. From early morning Litvinov's room was filled with his own countrymen. Bombeyev, Voroshilov, Pishchalkin, the two officers, the two Heidelberg students, all crowded in at once, and yet did not go away right up till dinner-time, though they had soon said all they had to say, and were obviously bored. They simply did not know what to do with themselves, and having got into Litvinov's lodgings they stuck there, as they say. First they discussed the fact that Gubaryov had gone back to Heidelberg, and that they would have to go after him. Then they philosophized a little, and touched on the Polish question. Then they advanced to reflections on gambling and cocottes, and fell to repeating scandalous anecdotes. At last the conversation sank into a discussion of all sorts of strong men and monsters of obesity and gluttony. First they trotted out all the ancient stories of Luking, of the deacon who ate no less than thirty-three herrings for a wager, of the Ulan colonel as Yedinov, renowned for his corpulence, and of the soldier who broke the shin-bone on his own forehead. Then followed unadulterated lying. Pishchalkin himself related with a yawn that he knew a peasant woman in Little Russia who at the time of her death had proved to weigh half a ton and some pounds, and a landowner who had eaten three geese and a sturgeon for luncheon. Bombeyev suddenly fell into an ecstatic condition, and declared he himself was able to eat a whole sheep, with seasoning, of course. And Voroshilov burst out with something about a comrade, an athletic cadet, so grotesque that every one was reduced to silence, and after looking at each other they took up their hats and the party broke up. Litvinov, when he was left alone, tried to occupy himself, but he felt just as if his head was full of smouldering soot. He could do nothing that was of any use, and the evening too was wasted. The next morning he was just preparing for lunch when someone knocked at his door. Good Lord, thought Litvinov, one of yesterday's dear friends again, and not without some trepidation he pronounced, Herein! 
The door opened slowly, and in walked Potugin. Litvinov was exceedingly delighted to see him. "'This is nice,' he began, warmly shaking hands with his unexpected visitor. "'This is good of you. I should certainly have looked you up myself, but you would not tell me where you live. Sit down, please. Put down your hat. Sit down.' Potugin made no response to Litvinov's warm welcome, and remained standing in the middle of the room, shifting from one leg to the other. He only laughed a little and shook his head. Litvinov's cordial reception obviously touched him, but there was some constraint in the expression of his face. "'There's some little misunderstanding,' he began, not without hesitation. "'Of course it would always be a pleasure, to me, but I have been sent especially to you that's to say do you mean commented litvinov in an injured voice that you would not have come to me of your own accord oh no indeed but i i should perhaps not have made up my mind to intrude on you to-day if i had not been asked to come to you in fact i have a message for you from whom may i ask from a person you know from irina pavlovna radmirov you promised three days ago to go and see her, and you have not been." Litvinov stared at Potugin in amazement. "'You know Madame Ratmirov?' "'As you see.' "'And you know her well?' "'I am, to a certain degree, a friend of hers.' Litvinov was silent for a little. "'Allow me to ask you,' he began at last, "'do you know why Irina Pavlovna wants to see me?' Potugin went up to the window. To a certain degree I do. She was, as far as I can judge, very pleased at meeting you. Well, and she wants to renew your former relations." Renew? repeated Litvinov. Excuse my indiscretion, but allow me to question you a little more. Do you know what was the nature of those relations? Strictly speaking, no, I don't know. But I imagine, added Potugin, turning suddenly to Litvinov, and looking affectionately at him. I imagine that they were of some value. Irina Pavlovna spoke very highly of you, and I was obliged to promise her I would bring you. Will you come? When? Now, at once. Litvinov merely made a gesture with his hand. Irina Pavlovna, pursued Putugin, supposes that the, how can I express it, the environment, shall we say, in which you found her the other day, was not likely to be particularly attractive to you. But she told me to tell you that the devil is not so black as he is fancied. Hmm. Does that saying apply strictly to the environment? Yes, and in general. Hmm. Well, and what is your opinion, Sozont Ivanitch, of the devil? I think, Grigory Mikhailitch, that he is in any case not what he has fancied. Is he better? Whether better or worse is hard to say, but certainly he is not the same as he has fancied. Well, shall we go? Sit here a little first. I must own that it still seems rather strange to me. What seems strange, may I make bold to inquire? In what way can you have become a friend of Irina Pavlovna? Potugin scanned himself with my appearance and my position in society it certainly does seem rather incredible but you know shakespeare has said already there are more things in heaven and earth horatio etc life too is not to be trifled with here is a simile for you a tree stands before you when there is no wind in what way can a leaf on a lower branch touch a leaf on an upper branch it's impossible but when the storm rises it is all changed, and the two leaves touch. Aha! So there were storms? I should think so. Can one live without them? But enough of philosophy. It's time to go. Litvinov was still hesitating. Oh, good Lord! cried Potugin with a comic face. What are young men coming to nowadays? A most charming lady invites them to see her sends messengers after them on purpose, and they raise difficulties. You ought to be ashamed, my dear sir, you ought to be ashamed. Here's your hat. Take it, and forbear it. 
as our ardent friends the germans say litvinov still stood irresolute for a moment but he ended by taking his hat and going out of the room with potugin End of chapter 11chapter twelve of smoke by ivan turgenev this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve they went to one of the best hotels in baden and asked for madame radmirov the porter first inquired their names and then answered at once that die frau Fürstin ist zu hause and went himself to conduct them up the staircase and knock at the door of the apartment and announce them de frau Fürstin received them promptly she was alone her husband had gone off to karlsruhe for an interview with a great official an influential personage who was passing through that town irina was sitting at a small table embroidering on canvas when potugin and litvinov crossed the threshold she quickly flung her embroidery aside pushed away the little table and got up an expression of genuine pleasure overspread her face she wore a morning dress high at the neck the superb lines of her shoulders and arms could be seen through the thin stuff her carelessly coiled hair had come loose and fell low on her slender neck irina flung a swift glance at potugin murmured merci and holding out her hand to litvinov reproached him amicably for forgetfulness and you such an old friend she added litvinov was beginning to apologize c'est bien c'est bien she assented hurriedly and taking his hat from him with friendly insistence made him sit down potugin too was sitting down but got up again directly and saying that he had an engagement he could not put off and that he would come in again after dinner he proceeded to take leave irina again flung him a rapid glance and gave him a friendly nod but she did not try to keep him and directly he had vanished behind the portier she turned with eager impatience to litvinov grigory mikhailitch she began speaking russian in her soft musical voice here we are alone at last and i can tell you how glad i am at our meeting because it it gives me a chance irina looked him straight in the face of asking your forgiveness litvinov gave an involuntary start he had not expected so swift an attack he had not expected she would herself turn the conversation upon old times forgiveness for what he muttered irina flushed for what you know for what she said and she turned slightly away i wronged you grigory mikhailitch though of course it was my fate litvinov was reminded of her letter and i do not regret it it would be in any case too late but meeting you so unexpectedly i said to myself that we absolutely must become friends absolutely and i should feel it deeply if it did not come about and it seems to me for that we must have an explanation without putting it off and once for all so that afterwards there should be no jeune no awkwardness once for all grigory mikhailitch and that you must tell me you forgive me or else i shall imagine you feel de la grancune voila it is perhaps a great piece of fatuity on my part for you have probably forgotten everything long long ago but no matter tell me you have forgiven me irina uttered this whole speech without taking breath and litvinov could see that there were tears shining in her eyes yes actually tears really irina pavlovna he began hurriedly how can you beg my pardon ask forgiveness that is all past and buried and i can only feel astounded that in the midst of all the splendour which surrounds you you have still preserved a recollection of the obscure companions of your youth does it astound you said irina softly it touches me litvinov went on because i could never have imagined you have not told me you have forgiven me though interposed irina i sincerely rejoice at your happiness irina pavlovna 
with my whole heart i wish you all that is best on earth and you will not remember evil against me i will remember nothing but the happy moments for which i was once indebted to you irina held out both hands to him litvinov clasped them warmly and did not at once let them go something that long had not been secretly stirred in his heart at that soft contact irina was again looking straight into his face but this time she was smiling and he for the first time gazed directly and intently at her again he recognized the features once so precious and those deep eyes with their marvellous lashes and the little mole on her cheek and the peculiar growth of her hair on her forehead and her habit of somehow sweetly and humorously curving her lips and faintly twitching her eyebrows all all he recognized but how beautiful she had grown what fascination what power in her fresh woman's body and no rouge no touching up no powder nothing false on that fresh pure face yes this was a beautiful woman a mood of musing came upon litvinov he was still looking at her but his thoughts were far away irina perceived it well that is excellent she said aloud now my conscience is at rest then and i can satisfy my curiosity curiosity repeated litvinov as though puzzled yes yes i want above all things to know what you have been doing all this time what plans you have i want to know all how what when all all and you will have to tell me the truth for i must warn you i have not lost sight of you so far as i could you did not lose sight of me you there in petersburg in the midst of the splendour which surrounded me as you expressed it just now positively yes i did not as for that splendour we will talk about that again but now you must tell me you must tell me so much at such length no one will disturb us ah how delightful it will be added irina gaily sitting down and arranging herself at her ease in an armchair come begin before telling my story i have to thank you began litvinov what for for the bouquet of flowers which made its appearance in my room what bouquet i know nothing about it what i tell you i know nothing about it but i am waiting i am waiting for your story ah what a good fellow that potugin is to have brought you litvinov pricked up his ears have you known this mr potugin long he queried yes a long while but tell me your story and do you know him well oh yes irina sighed there are special reasons you have heard of course of eliza bielsky who died you know the year before last such a dreadful death ah to be sure i'd forgotten you don't know all our scandals it is well it is well indeed that you don't know them oh quelle chance at last at last a man a live man who knows nothing of us and to be able to talk russian with him bad russian of course but still russian not that everlasting mawkish sickening french patter of petersburg and potugin you say was connected with it's very painful for me even to refer to it irina broke in eliza was my greatest friend at school and afterwards in petersburg we saw each other continually she confided all her secrets to me she was very unhappy she suffered much potugin behaved splendidly in the affair with true chivalry he sacrificed himself it was only then i learnt to appreciate him but we have drifted away again i am waiting for your story grigory mikhailitch but my story cannot interest you the least irina pavlovna that's not your affair think irina pavlovna we have not seen each other for ten years ten whole years how much water has flowed by since then not water only not water only she repeated with a peculiar bitter expression that's just why i want to hear what you are going to tell me and besides i really don't know where to begin 
at the beginning from the very time when you when i went away to petersburg you left moscow then do you know i have never been back to moscow since really it was impossible at first and afterwards when i was married have you been married long four years have you no children no she answered dryly litvinov was silent for a little and did you go on living at that uh, what was his name count riesenbach's till your marriage irina looked steadily at him as though she were trying to make up her mind why he asked that question no was her answer at last i suppose your parents by the way i haven't asked about them are they they are both well and living at moscow as before at moscow as before and your brothers and sisters they are all right i have provided for all of them ah litvinov glanced up from under his brows at irina in reality irina pavlovna it's not i who ought to tell my story but you if only he suddenly felt embarrassed and stopped irina raised her hands to her face and turned her wedding ring round upon her finger well i will not refuse she assented at last some day perhaps but first you because do you see though i tried to follow you up i know scarcely anything of you while of me well of me you have heard enough certainly haven't you i suppose you have heard of me tell me you irina pavlovna occupied too conspicuous a place in the world not to be the subject of talk especially in the provinces where i have been and where every rumour is believed and do you believe the rumours and of what kind were the rumours to tell the truth irina pavlovna such rumours very seldom reached me i have led a very solitary life how so why you were in the crimea in the militia you know that too as you see i tell you you have been watched again litvinov felt puzzled why am i to tell you what you know without me said litvinov in an undertone why to do what i ask you you see i ask you grigory mikhailitch litvinov bowed his head and began began in rather a confused fashion to recount in rough outline to irina his uninteresting adventures he often stopped and looked inquiringly at irina as though to ask whether he had told enough but she insistently demanded the continuation of his narrative and pushing her hair back behind her ears her elbows on the arm of her chair she seemed to be catching every word with strained attention looking at her from one side and following the expression on her face any one might perhaps have imagined she did not hear what litvinov was saying at all but was only deep in meditation but it was not of litvinov she was meditating though he grew confused and red under her persistent gaze a whole life was rising up before her a very different one not his life but her own litvinov did not finish his story but stopped short under the influence of an unpleasant sense of growing inner discomfort this time irina said nothing to him and did not urge him to go on but pressing her open hand to her eyes as though she were tired she leaned slowly back in her chair and remained motionless litvinov waited for a little then reflecting that his visit had already lasted more than two hours he was stretching out his hand for his hat when suddenly in an adjoining room there was the sound of the rapid creak of thin kid boots and preceded by the same exquisite aristocratic perfume there entered valerian vladimirovich ratmirov litvinov rose and interchanged bows with the good-looking general while irina with no sign of haste took her hand from her face and looking coldly at her husband remarked in french ah so you've come back but what time is it nearly four ma chérie amie and you not dressed yet the princess will be expecting us answered the general and with an elegant bend of his tightly laced figure in litvinov's direction he added with the almost effeminate playfulness of intonation characteristic of him it's clear an agreeable visitor has made you forgetful of time 
The reader will permit us at this point to give him some information about General Ratmirov. His father was the natural, what do you suppose? You are not wrong, but we didn't mean to say that, the natural son of an illustrious personage of the reign of Alexander I, and of a pretty little French actress. The illustrious personage brought his son forward in the world, but left him no fortune, and the son himself, the father of our hero, had not time to grow rich. He died before he had risen above the rank of a colonel in the police. A year before his death he had married a handsome young widow who had happened to put herself under his protection. His son by the widow, Valerian Alexandrovitch, having got into the corps of pages by favour, attracted the notice of the authorities, not so much by his success in the sciences as by his fine bearing, his fine manners, and his good behaviour, though he had been exposed to all that pupils in the government military schools were inevitably exposed to in the former days, and went into the guards. His career was a brilliant one, thanks to the discreet gaiety of his disposition, his skill in dancing, his excellent seat on horseback when an orderly at reviews, and lastly, by a kind of special trick of deferential familiarity with his superiors, of tender, attentive, almost clinging subservience, with a flavour of vague liberalism, light as air. This liberalism had not, however, prevented him from flogging fifty peasants in a white Russian village, where he had been sent to put down a riot. His personal appearance was most prepossessing and singularly youthful-looking. Smooth-faced and rosy-cheeked, pliant and persistent, he made the most of his amazing success with women. Ladies of the highest rank and mature age simply went out of their senses over him. Cautious from habit, silent from motives of prudence, General Ratmirov moved constantly in the highest society, like the busy bee gathering honey even from the least attractive flowers, and without morals, without information of any kind, but with the reputation of being good at business. With an insight into men, and a ready comprehension of the exigencies of the moment, and above all, a never-swerving desire for his own advantage, he saw at last all paths lying open before him. Litvinov smiled constrainedly, while Irina merely shrugged her shoulders. Well, she said in the same cold tone, did you see the Count? To be sure I saw him. He told me to remember him to you. Ah! Is he as imbecile as ever, that patron of yours? General Radmirov made no reply. He only smiled to himself, as though lenient to the over-hastiness of a woman's judgment. With just such a smile, kindly disposed, grown-up people respond to the nonsensical whims of children. Yes, Irina went on, the stupidity of your friend the Count is too striking, even when one has seen a good deal of the world. You sent me to him yourself, muttered the general, and turning to Litvinov, he asked him in Russian, was he getting any benefit from the Baden waters? I am in perfect health, I'm thankful to say, answered Litvinov. That's the greatest of blessings, pursued the general with an affable grimace. And indeed, one doesn't, as a rule, come to Baden for the waters. But the waters here are very effectual. Je veux dire efficace. And any one who suffers, as I do, for instance, from a nervous cough, Irina rose quickly. "'We will see each other again, Grigory Mikhailitch, and I hope soon,' she said in French, contemptuously cutting short her husband's speech. "'But now I must go and dress. That old princess is insufferable with her everlasting partie de plaisir, of which nothing comes but boredom.' "'You're hard on every one to-day,' muttered her husband, and he slipped away into the next room. Litvinov was turning towards the door. Irina stopped him. "'You have told me everything,' she said. "'But the chief thing you concealed.' "'What's that?' "'You are going to be married, I'm told?' Litvinov blushed up to his ears. As a fact, he had intentionally not referred to Tanya. But he felt horribly vexed, first, that Irina knew about his marriage, and secondly, 
that she had, as it were, convicted him of a desire to conceal it from her. He was completely at a loss what to say, while Irina did not take her eyes off him. "'Yes, I am going to be married,' he said at last, and at once withdrew. Ratmirov came back into the room. "'Well, why aren't you dressed?' he asked. "'You can go alone. My head aches. But the princess!' Irina scanned her husband from head to foot in one look, turned her back upon him, and went away to her boudoir. End of chapter 12「Thirteen of Smoke » by Ivan Turgenev. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen. Litvinov felt much annoyed with himself, as though he had lost money at roulette, or failed to keep his word. An inward voice told him that he, on the eve of marriage, a man of sober sense, not a boy, ought not to have given way to the promptings of curiosity nor the allurements of recollection. Much need there was to go, he reflected. On her side simply flirtation, whim, caprice. She's bored, she's sick of everything, she clutched at me, as someone pampered with dainties will suddenly long for black bread. Well, that's natural enough. But why did I go? Can I feel anything but contempt for her? This last phrase he could not utter, even in thought, without an effort. Of course there's no kind of danger, and never could be," he pursued his reflections. I know whom I have to deal with, but still one ought not to play with fire. I'll never set my foot in her place again. Litvinov dared not, or could not, as yet, confess to himself how beautiful Irina had seemed to him, how powerfully she had worked upon his feelings. Again the day passed dully and drearily. At dinner Litvinov chanced to sit beside a majestic bellum, with dyed moustaches, who said nothing, and only panted and rolled his eyes, but being suddenly taken with a hiccup, proved himself to be a fellow-countryman, by at once exclaiming with feeling, in Russian, "'There! I said I ought not to eat melons!' In the evening, too, nothing happened to compensate for a lost day. Bindasov, before Litvinov's very eyes, won a sum four times what he had borrowed from him, but, far from repaying his debt, he positively glared in his face with a menacing air, as though he were prepared to borrow more from him just because he had been a witness of his winnings. The next morning he was again invaded by a host of his compatriots. Litvinov got rid of them with difficulty, and setting off to the mountains he first came across Irina, he pretended not to recognize her, and passed quickly by, and then Potugin. He was about to begin a conversation with Potugin, but the latter did not respond to him readily. He was leading by the hand a smartly dressed little girl, with fluffy, almost white curls, large black eyes, and a pale, sickly little face, with that peculiar peremptory and impatient expression characteristic of spoiled children. Litvinov spent two hours in the mountains, and then went back homewards along the Lichtenthaler Ali. A lady, sitting on a bench, with a blue veil over her face, got up quickly and came up to him. He recognized Irina. "'Why do you avoid me, Grigory Mikhailitch?' she said, in the unsteady voice of one who is boiling over within. Litvinov was taken aback. "'I avoid you, Irina Pavlovna?' Yes, you, you. Irina seemed excited, almost angry. You are mistaken, I assure you. No, I am not mistaken. Do you suppose this morning, when we met, I mean, do you suppose I didn't see that you knew me? Do you mean to say you did not know me? Tell me. I really, Irina Pavlovna. Grigory Mikhailitch, you're a straightforward man. You have always told the truth. Tell me, tell me, you knew me, didn't you? You turned away on purpose?" Litvinov glanced at Irina. Her eyes shone with a strange light, while her cheeks and lips were of a deathly pallor under the thick net of her veil. In the expression of her face 
in the very sound of her abruptly jerked out whisper there was something so irresistibly mournful beseeching litvinov could not pretend any longer yes i knew you he uttered not without effort irina slowly shuddered and slowly dropped her hands why did you not come up to me she whispered why why litvinov moved on one side away from the path irina followed him in silence why he repeated once more and suddenly his face was aflame and he felt his chest and throat choking with a passion akin to hatred you you ask such a question after all that has passed between us not now of course not now but there there in moscow but you know we decided you know you promised irina was beginning i have promised nothing pardon the harshness of my expressions but you ask for the truth so think for yourself to what but a caprice incomprehensible i confess to me to what but a desire to try how much power you still have over me can i attribute your i don't know what to call it your persistence our paths have lain so far apart i have forgotten it all i've lived through all that suffering long ago i've become a different man completely you are married happy at least in appearance you fill an envied position in the world what's the object what's the use of our meeting what am i to you what are you to me we cannot even understand each other now there is absolutely nothing in common between us now neither in the past nor in the present especially especially in the past litvinov uttered all this speech hurriedly jerkily without turning his head irina did not stir except from time to time she faintly stretched her hands out to him it seemed as though she were beseeching him to stop and listen to her while at his last words she slightly bit her lower lip as though to master the pain of a sharp rapid wound grigory mikhailitch she began at last in a calmer voice and she moved still further away from the path along which people from time to time passed Litvinov in his turn followed her grigory mikhailitch believe me if i could imagine i had one hair's breadth of power over you left i would be the first to avoid you if i have not done so if i made up my mind in spite of my of the wrong i did you in the past to renew my acquaintance with you it was because 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 what asked litvinov almost rudely because irina declared with sudden force it's too insufferable too unbearably stifling for me in society in the envied position you talk about because meeting you a live man after all these dead puppets you have seen samples of them three days ago there au vieux chateau i rejoice over you as an oasis in the desert while you suspect me of flirting and despise me and repulse me on the ground that i wronged you as indeed i did but far more myself you chose your lot yourself irina pavlovna litvinov rejoined sullenly as before not turning his head i chose it myself yes and i don't complain i have no right to complain said irina hurriedly she seemed to derive a secret consolation from litvinov's very harshness i know that you must think ill of me and i won't justify myself i only want to explain my feeling to you i want to convince you i am in no flirting humour now me flirting with you why there is no sense in it when i saw you all that was good that was young in me revived that time when i had not yet chosen my lot everything that lies behind in that streak of brightness behind those ten years come really irina pavlovna so far as i am aware the brightness in your life began precisely with the time we separated irina put her handkerchief to her lips that's very cruel what you say grigory mikhailitch but i can't feel angry with you oh no that was not a bright time it was not for happiness i left moscow 
I have known not one moment, not one instant of happiness. Believe me, whatever you have been told. If I were happy, could I talk to you as I am talking now? I repeat to you, you don't know what these people are. Why, they understand nothing, feel for nothing. They've no intelligence even. Ni esprit, ni intelligence. Nothing but tact and cunning. Why, in reality, music and poetry and art are all equally remote from them. You will say that I was rather indifferent to all that myself? But not to the same degree, Grigory Mikhailitch, not to the same degree. It's not a woman of the world before you now. You need only look at me. Not a society queen, that's what they call us, I believe, but a poor, poor creature, really deserving of pity. Don't wonder at my words. I am beyond feeling pride now. I hold out my hand to you as a beggar. Will you understand? Just as a beggar. I ask for charity, she added suddenly, in an involuntary, irrepressible outburst. I ask for charity, and you— Her voice broke. Litvinov raised his head and looked at Irina. Her breathing came quickly, her lips were quivering. Suddenly his heart beat fast, and the feeling of hatred vanished. "'You say that our paths have lain apart,' Irina went on. "'I know you are about to marry from inclination. You have a plan laid out for your whole life. Yes, that's all so. But we have not become strangers to one another, Grigory Mikhailitch we can still understand each other. Or do you imagine I have grown altogether dull, altogether debased in the mire? Ah, no, don't think that, please. Let me open my heart, I beseech you, there, even for the sake of those old days, if you are not willing to forget them. Do so, that our meeting may not have come to pass in vain. That would be too bitter. It would not last long in any case. I don't know how to say it properly, but you will understand me, because I ask for little, so little, only a little sympathy, only that you should not repulse me, that you should let me open my heart." Irina ceased speaking. There were tears in her voice. She sighed and, timidly, with a kind of furtive, searching look, gazed at Litvinov, held out her hand to him. Litvinov slowly took the hand and faintly pressed it. Let us be friends," whispered Irina. "'Friends,' repeated Litvinov dreamily. "'Yes, friends. Or, if that is too much to ask, then let us at least be friendly. Let us be simply as though nothing had happened.' "'As though nothing had happened,' repeated Litvinov again. "'You said just now, Irina Pavlovna, that I was unwilling to forget the old days. But what if I can't forget them?" A blissful smile flashed over Irina's face, and at once disappeared, to be replaced by a harassed, almost scared expression. "'Be like me, Grigory Mikhailitch. Remember only what was good in them. And most of all, give me your word, your word of honour. "'Well? Not to avoid me, not to hurt me for nothing. You promise? Tell me! Yes. And you will dismiss all evil thoughts of me from your mind? Yes, but as for understanding you, I give it up. There's no need of that. Wait a little, though. You will understand. But you will promise? I have said yes already. Thanks. You see, I am used to believe you. I shall expect you to-day, to-morrow. I will not go out of the house. And now I must leave you. The Grand Duchess is coming along the avenue. She's caught sight of me, and I can't avoid going up to speak to her. Good-bye till we meet. Give me your hand. Vita, Vita, till we meet." And warmly pressing Litvinov's hand, Irina walked toward a middle-aged person of dignified appearance, who was coming slowly along the gravel path, escorted by two other ladies and a strikingly handsome groom in livery. Ah, oh, bonjour, chère madame, said the personage, while Irina curtsied respectfully to her. Comment allez-vous aujourd'hui? Venez en peu avec moi. Votre tête a trop de bonté. Irina's insinuating voice was heard in reply. 
End of chapter 13